I thank the Lord for being here today. God bless each and every one of you. It was nice to see familiar faces in the crowd. I, I, man, there's a lot of family here. Wow, that's, that's cool. There's nothing, that, there's nothing that beats church family. Really, seriously. Like, I love my family from afar. I love them. Um, I love them. I love them. I, I mean, you know, you can't choose your family. I mean, right? Sometimes I laugh. I'm like, seriously, God, you gave me him? Seriously, him? I, I turned 44 yesterday. Yesterday was my birthday, and uh, thank you so much, yeah. And uh, my cousin, my cousin, who I just, we were rivals since birth, and, and uh, he came into town not knowing it was my birthday. He said, let's go have dinner. I'm thinking, like, my cousin wants to take me to dinner on my birthday. Wow, he remembered. It wasn't until midway through dinner that he realized it was my birthday, and I'm like, thanks. That's why I hate you. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so, um, but, you know, we, we, we can't pick our family, but we could pick our friends. Amen. And, and, our, and sometimes our friends become like family. And uh, I have friends in here today that are like my brothers. And, uh, and I, would, I would give them a lung. Um, I don't know about lung. Kidney, definitely. Um, a lung? Uh, I don't know. But uh, I thank the Lord for them and for everyone here. So I turned 44 yesterday. And for 44 years, I've had the nickname Chubbs. My uncle named me after a little character off the Little Rascals called uh, Chubby. And it was a day that my mom uh, dressed me in uh, uh, a sailor suit. And it just so happened the day that my uncle uh, named me Chubby, Chubby wore a sailor suit. And when I hurt myself, he looked at me and then looked at the TV and he said I looked identical like Chubby. And thus the nickname Chubby was born uh, in me. And as I got older, of course, you know, more mature, Chubbs. And so... Um, <laughs> And then when I went into ministry, and became Pastor Chubbs. And so I've had that for forever, and I don't think I'll ever get, uh, get away from that. And I, I used to use it as a badge of, uh, uh, I used to struggle with that name, but now I use it as a badge of honor. And Because uh, the bottom line is people will remember Pastor Chubbs way before they remember Ramiro Quiroz, right? I mean, I mean, they won't ever remember that. But you say Chubbs, like, oh, yeah, that one guy. So uh, I thank the Lord for being here. Last week, I had the opportunity um, to go with my family to go speak, not go speak, go and uh, be at uh, the camp, uh, Camp Hume Lake up in the Sierras was the day that I gave my life, was the camp that I gave my life to the Lord on December, on December 14th, 1991, uh, when I gave my life to Christ. Uh, the, the clock was still there, the pews were still there. In my mind, I, I thought it was bigger, and I thought the camp was nicer, I really did, uh, but the carpets were horrible and the pews were nasty. And so um, I, I just, you know, you don't, you tend to kind of glamorize a little bit more uh, uh, what, of things of your past, right? You know, you kind of remember, you know, going fishing, that, that the fish was this big, but in actuality it was that big, you know, it was that kind of that thing. And so we went back, and on the way to, on the way to camp, um, I began to re- remind myself, or God began to remind me of the, the feelings, the emotions, and come, driving up those mountains, and I, just, I, I was expecting God to uh, do something. I was expecting God to move in a mighty way. I, was, I, was, I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe the, to, uh, a dove to ascend from heaven you know, up to me and, or a bright light or something. I was expecting God to maybe even uh, hear an audible voice, you know, this is my son. You know, that, I have no idea what I was expecting. And, uh, but when I got there and I went to the exact place where I gave my life to the Lord, I found, uh, found peace. And it was a peace that could pass all understanding. I was expecting for the goosebumps and, the, and my heart to beat really fast, to cry even. But I just felt an overwhelming peace and a thankfulness that came, that came over me. And, and I began to, uh, from that point to now, I began to evaluate my life and what God has given me and where God has taken me. Uh, if, if you would have told me back then in 1991... What, what I would have done and where would I've been and what I am doing today, I would have laughed at you because I was just, you know, this little homeboy from San Jose, California on the east side that stuttered everywhere he went. And to be able to go, to do what God has allowed me to do has been an honor and humbling. And I thank the Lord that I said yes. I said yes to the call. I said yes to what he wanted for my life. And, and, and I didn't think I had anything to give him. But one thing I love about God, church, is that God will take whatever you have and use it for his glory. God will use what you have right now and use it for his glory. Uh, seriously, and you may be thinking, well, I'm a nobody. I don't have a lot of talent. I don't have anything to give. Tell you what, God, and, and by yourself, it's nothing. But at the hands of an almighty God, it is everything. It is everything you absolutely need. So I, I need you to understand and believe that you're not, you're not designed. You're, you're not where you are today because that's all you have. You are there because God has placed you there. And you are there because God wants, has a purpose and a plan for your life. And you may be thinking, well, I'm just a mom, or I'm just a worker, or I just do this, or I just do that. I need to let you know that God has you there. 
that God has positioned you in such a way or in, in a perfect position for you to be a blessing to others. That's why the book of James says that we should kind of all joy when trial and tribulation comes our way. Can you understand that? Now, when things are going great, we can say amen and yes to that scripture. But when hell and high water is coming against us and you can't see beyond your problems or beyond your situation or beyond your home life, that scripture, it's hard. It's hard to really grasp that scripture. It really is. It's really hard to count it all joy when we're right in the middle of our mess. It's hard. Come on. It, it's hard. How can we count it all joy when our family's falling apart and our, our business is falling apart and our, and our friendships are falling apart? Everything around us, those, those people that said they'll never leave you, nor forsake you, or the very ones that are stabbing you in the back. How is this, God, all joy? It, it amazes me. And, but I understand the scripture. There's a scripture. There's, I love scripture, by the way. And there's a few scripture that jumps out at me. Because you know why? Because God of the Bible is still speaking today. God has, from the moment God breathed life into this planet, into this galaxy, into this universe, God has not stopped talking. I thank God for that. And I thank God for his word because it is living. And one scripture may mean one thing to you one year, and the following year, that scripture means something completely different. And it's because God's word is alive. It is living. Yes, it's on paper. Yes, it's a book. Yes, it's, on, it's there for us to read. But it is living, and it is true, and it is for you and for me today and forevermore. And what I love about Scripture, he promises this, that he will never give us more than what we could bear. Think about that. And think about the situations that we are in or that we just came out of or what we may be going into. That God has enough confidence in me that he knows I have enough in me to get through whatever I'm going through right now. Isn't that amazing? That God said that God chose you to go through what you're going through right now. And maybe, well, that's jacked up. Why would God choose me? Because God knows he has it, you have it inside of you to get through whatever you're going through. Okay? And maybe you may think, well, God, why would God choose me? Why am I not enough? Can I tell you something? That God is going to use whatever you're going through right now because there's someone down the road that needs to, experience, or to, need to have a witness of what you're going through right now. Someone down the road is going to need to hear your testimony on what you are going through right now. Do you understand that? And so I understand that scripture. And that scripture speaks of volumes to me. But you know what's another one? Another one says, when you've done all you can do to stand, just stand. Because standing sometimes is the only thing we got. It's the only thing we got. And we just kind of sit there, and even that was a struggle. Putting on our shoes, putting on our makeup, getting clothes on, coming to church. That sometimes that's a struggle. Because we're sitting there looking at everybody else and seeing everybody else's blessings and everybody else's overcomings, and we're sitting there saying, dude, what about me? Right? It's like we're making an altar call. I hate that when I go to an altar call, and everybody else is falling down, and everybody else is getting blessed, and everybody else is getting a breakthrough, and I'm like, dude, dude, what about me? Right? And that, I mean, listen, listen, I'm going to keep it real with y'all. I'm going to keep it real with y'all. I am blessed when everybody else is getting blessed. I really am, seriously. But when I'm hurting and I need a financial breakthrough and I need a healing or I need an answered prayer, it, it's horrible <laughs> to see somebody else being blessed and you're not. I'm like, for real? You live like the devil Monday through Saturday and God is blessing you. <laughs> for real? And you begin to tell God, hey, pay attention. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Your journey is your journey. Your journey is your journey. We are, not, we are not to look to the left or to the right, but we are to look to Jesus. Because your journey is your journey. So when someone else is getting blessed, thank God for them because your blessing's on the way. Oh, come on, somebody, listen. Your blessing is on the way. Listen, I have, a, I have four cars in my life, in my family right now. Two of them work. The other two, huh, it only it depends on the day. And I have one, I'm stuck on the road. One's literally a paperweight on my driveway right now. But I, but, and then I see my friend who lives like the devil, who doesn't even believe in God, buying four, five, six cars. I'm thinking, God bless, God bless him, God bless him. God bless him, God bless him, because mine's coming. Mine's coming. But there have been times I'm looking at him like, mm, don't post one more picture, see what happens. Post one more picture. Post one more picture in front of your, post it, I dare you. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm just saying. I'm not frustrated. I'm actually encouraged today. <laughs> but your journey is your journey. If there's something I want to walk you away with is that you are in the perfect place and the perfect time to do what God has called you to do. You are. The miracle that you need is already inside of you. 
Because Christ promised before he left, everything I have, I give to you in, the name of, in my name. Listen, in my name. In my name. He says, everything that you need, you already have. I reminded of the widow who, was, who had a bunch of debt and who was basically given up on life. And, told, and the prophet asked, do you have anything in your house? And she said, I have nothing. And the prophet said, oh, I do have a flask of oil. She's, and the prophet said, go get the pots from your neighbors and grab as many as you can. And, that, and she, she had no understanding of what that was for. What, sometimes God asks you to do things that have, you, have, you have no clue why he is doing what he is doing. You have no clue why he's asking you to do something so insignificant. Can I tell you something? God has a plan for each and every one of us. That woman grabbed all the pots she possibly can, grabbed that little small flask of oil, and began to pour oil in all the pots. Can I tell you, according to what I've studied and what I know, that, that little flask of oil should have never even filled half of the first pot. But the scripture says that the oil did not cease until the very last pot was filled. The very last pot was filled, and the miracle didn't stop there. It wasn't like, oh, my God, look at this. There was, two, there was more to that. The Bible says that she was able to pay off all her debt, that she got herself out of the situation because she listened to the man of God. She listened to the man of God, and, and instead of giving up and just saying, forget this, God hates me. I don't know why God's been, God put me through this. She listened to the word of the Lord from the man of God, and she did exactly what she was supposed to do, and that got her out of her situation. Sometimes we don't listen. Sometimes we're too busy complaining and telling God our situation and giving him a resume and why we shouldn't be going through what we're going through. And God is just waiting for us to shut up so he can speak. Sometimes we're so closed up that we don't hear the word of God coming from this man to speak to us. And sometimes instead of receiving, we complain. Sometimes we sit there, well, you don't know my situation and you don't know what I've been through. And he may not, but God does. Because God has walked with you the entire time. He's never left you nor forsaken you. Scripture says, though, draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. You know what that means? That's a promise that, God, I ain't going to leave you no matter what hell or high water comes my way, but you better come with me. Man, Moses said, I'll go, but you better go too. And sometimes when God is putting us through some situations, I'm like, hey, I'll do this, but you better come with me because if not, I ain't going. Do you understand that? And so we really, we really, we struggle with that. We, we, we kind of just, I mean, I'm not even supposed to be preaching this, but I'm just, I, somebody needs to hear this this morning. That your journey is your journey. That you're supposed to be in the spot that you're in today. But, but that woman followed the direction of the man of God, and she was able to be fulfilled. Last week, I heard a preacher, he was, he was preaching at our church, and he was talking about doing a mission. He went on a mission trip to Nepal, and he was so excited because and I, we all know this preacher, and, we, and he's very well known, and, and he, he's done a lot of mission trips, been done a lot of great work. He's a leader of leaders, trains leaders all the time. He was so excited because he was going to go train pastors and churches in Nepal. And if you know anything about Nepal, uh, they don't look too kindly on Christians. So it was kind of like on a down low, but not really, but it was. And so he was so excited because he trained his team to go with him. He was so excited. That he felt that he was going to change Nepal. Revival was going to break out. Ah! So excited. And he said on one of the days, his, tra his translator left, and, and, and somebody from another village that was about three hours away came and through, you know, broken English and some kind of Nepali, Nepalese or whatever you call it, whatever they speak in Nepal. And they, through that, he realized that they needed help in the village, not knowing what the help was, just that the team that he brought, the leaders of leaders, were supposed to go and help this village. So they took a three-hour hike into the mountains of Nepal, and they arrived to a village. Not, you know, he was thinking that maybe there's going to be revival, somebody's sick, there's going to be somebody healed. He's praying. He's, God, use me in a mighty way. You know, you know how it is, right? You know, when, when God is setting you up for something, like, dear God, just be with me. Hallelujah to the land. You know, when someone calls a pastor and you show up, you're like, oh, man, I'm pray for sick. <laughs> Pop up. I mean, I get that. I, I've been there. I've been, been there, done that. I, I prayed, and I'm expecting God to do something, and they're just laying there, and I'm like, hmm. Dude, I remember going to a church, I'm not going to church, going to a hospital one time because they called the church and the, the pastor sent me. And I was so fired up. I was so excited. It was my first time as I was young in ministry. I was just started in ministry. I'm thinking, I'm going to save the world, right? And I go into this. I mean, I was so anointed. When I walked to the doors of the hospital, it opened. <laughs> it's the kind of anointing I had that day, people. <sighs> I'm here. I'm here. 
little old sister, God bless her soul, she had the little heart thing and all, boop, boop, and all stuff. And I'm thinking, I'm going to pray for her, and she's going to pop out of bed. Boom, because God is in me. Right? Prayed for her. Nothing happened. Appreciate that. That's awesome. Nothing happened. Prayed again. Nothing happened. I'm like, hmm, I'm doing something wrong. Prayed again. Nothing happened. She ended up dying. Not that day, but a few days later. Huh. As a young preacher, I'm sitting there like this going, huh. Yeah, that was horrible. But I learned something that day, that God has his own plans. And it was better for her to go home, go home, than to live the life that she lived. I'm thinking, hmm, I learned something. So this guy's pre, you know, he gets there, and this preacher gets to the village, three hours hike, and he finds a dead buffalo. You know those mountain buffaloes? Finds it. And through communication, interpretation, and all that stuff, they needed to dig a hole in the, in the, mount, in the, in the, in the, in the ground so they could basically bury the buffalo. And, of course, he's there as a servant leader. He's there to serve the people in Nepal. He begins to dig. Well, they lived in the mountains. Well, there's rock in the mountains. And he said about four hours, five hours into this dig, the, 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 the hole was only three feet. And so he started to complain to God. Like, say, God, where, what are you doing? God, where have you been? On and on. And he started, you know, you know, when we're going through some stuff and we don't understand, we tend to complain to God in such a way where it's passive aggressive. When we begin to remind God what we've done for him, right? We begin to remind God of, of what we've been, where we've been, what we've done, what we could have done, but we didn't because we're Christians, right? Well, God, I could have done this, but I didn't. You know what I'm talking about, right? Going through some stuff, and, and he was keeping it to himself because he was the leader of the group, but he began to hear the other people murmur, so he joined in the murmuring with them. Can I tell you, when you hang out with people that murmur, nothing, come, nothing good comes from it. Nothing good comes from hanging out with other folks that are complaining. Nothing good at all. I, trust me, I know. Because I've joined in. I'm not perfect. I'd be like, yeah, you're right. Because we want to be in the group. We want to be part of the group that agrees with other people. Because we're looking for people to agree with us. Oh, man, that could preach right there. We're looking for people that will agree with us. So if you have a nasty attitude, we will seek out other people that have nasty attitudes. Do you know why? Because we need them to confirm what we are feeling. We need them to affirm us, to agree with us. That what we are seeing and, and hearing and, and talking, that they agree, so we want to agree with them. Have you noticed that we will always hang out with people that are just like us? Can I tell you something? God wants something more for each and every one of us. If you're the best in your group, you need a different group. You need to hang out with people that will make you want to be better. You really do. I'm not saying you have to be their best friends, but you need to be challenged and encouraged. And when you walk away from a conversation or a meeting or coffee or dinner, that you want to be better. That's the kind of people you need to seek out. You need to, not those that are just around. And if you're in the best in your group, you need to find a bigger group. Your, your, your horizon needs to be bigger. Does that make sense? Your vertical and the horizontal, you, your vertical needs to be a little different too. Because you need to listen to God and what God is doing in your life. So this pastor was there and he was struggling and on and on. Well, six hours later, finally the interpreter comes and they get the hole deep enough. They put this carcass in the ground and they dig it all up and they, they kind of pat it down. The interpreter shows up. He's, is that for me? Oh, you're the best. I'm getting off the mic or off the stage. I'm sorry. Oh, Lord. Church, listen. Listen. I'm going to commend you guys seriously right now. Me and Pastor Dave mess around all the time. He's like a brother I never had, ever wanted. Um, but <laughs> But seriously speaking, seriously speaking, from the moment I got off the car, with my wife, or with my daughter and my little boy. So the moment I came into here, I was greeted by every single person here. No, and not a lot of people knew, unless they remembered me on the picture of the, of the thing, but I didn't think many of them knew who I was, and they were just greeting me. It, it was something that was, I want to say, almost over the top, because I was not expecting that whatsoever. Can I tell you, church, you guys are doing what God has called you to do in a, in a darkness that needs hope and love and faith. Seriously, never, never, ever, 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 ever lose that because there are going to be some hurting people that will come into this place and will stay because of the hospitality that they received. They may not understand it right away, but they're going to say, I feel good in this place. And sometimes this place needs to be a place of healing and restoration, a place where people, after they've stood up, like they could just come and just relax and be loved on. You know, our job is to love people. That's our job. Our job is to love people, and God will do the fixing.
We're not called to fix anybody. We're called to love people. Love God and love people. And I thank this church for that, really. God bless you guys, seriously. So this right here, that's pretty dope, Pastor. That's, and it's ice. It's ice water. Shoot. Eli said he wasn't going to me water, and here he's drinking a bottle, drinking my bottle water. That's cool. Appreciate you, Eli. I'm looking at you like, for reals, is that my bottle water you're supposed to give me? <laughs> so he gets the buffalo in the hole, pats, puts dirt on it. He's thinner, complaining, has a nasty attitude. Why God brought in Nepal to dig a hole, went around the world. This little old lady comes with tea, with tears in her eyes, and she says, she thanked him for digging the hole and, and getting the buffalo in there. She said that if that buffalo would have not been in the ground, put in the ground that day, that the animals of the mountains would have came and ate the carcass. But not only ate the carcass, they would have killed the children of the village. She thanked them because she said that they saved their village. Isn't that amazing? That sometimes we think what we are doing is so insignificant that we don't know why God is doing what he's doing, but God is setting you up for one of the greatest blessings you will ever have in your whole entire life. God is setting you up. If you're going through it, if, if you are in the storm of storms, God is setting you up. I'm reminded of a story when the disciples who were being, I think I preached it the last time I was here, but the disciples were, were scared of, of a storm had hit the Sea of Galilee, and they were scared of drowning. And, and I love what Jesus did. He didn't answer them a word. He got up on top of the boat, and he told the winds to cease. He didn't tear the waters. He told the winds. That is so significant for you and I because before we could ever see it, we need to speak it out of our mouth. Before it ever happens, we need to speak it out, out, out with our mouths. We have to have faith before we see it. We have to believe that it's going to happen for each and every one of us before it actually happens. You know, I was telling a sister outside, I was speaking to her, and I don't know her name, but she left. But I was speaking to her, I said, one of the most frustrating things in my life has been flying from one place to another, and right before I'm going to land, the airport or the tower puts us in a holding pattern. It's the most frustrating thing in the whole entire life because you from the plane could look down at your destination, but the tower is not allowing you to land. There, It is out of your ability, power. It is out of your know-how, your knowledge. You can know all that and be all that. You could have the titles and the positions, and you could have all the money in the world, but for whatever reason, you can't get to your destination because you're in a holding pattern. The most frustrating place to be in life is when God puts you in a holding pattern. Do you know why God does that? It's because he loves you so much that he knows if you get to the destination the way you are right now, you're going to mess it up. You're going to mess up the blessing that God has for you. Because he knows you can't handle the blessing he wants to give you right now. So you have to go through a holding pattern and learn some things first before you can get to your ultimate destination. David was that man. In the book of Psalms, chapter 78, and don't worry, I'm preaching. Psalms, chapter 78, verse 70, it says, it says, he chose David, his servant, from sheep pen, from tending the sheep. He brought them to the, to the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart and skillful hands. He led them. That is so important because David was the best king Israel has ever had. David was the king of kings. He was the best one. He was the last king to actually hold them together, the both northern and southern kingdoms. But he did not become the man he was when he ascended to the throne. He became the man he was when he was by himself tending sheep. It was in the loneliest of times, in the most, in the most absolute desolate places, when it was just him, God, and some sheep that he learned to be the man that God needed him to be. See, before we ever ascend to wherever we are going, before we ever land in the destination that we're going to, we must first learn to know who God is in the private. It's when we're by ourselves that God begins to teach us, to, to envision things, for us to learn things that no one else has. That's why our journey is our journey. That's why we shouldn't complain that we're not where we think we're supposed to be. We should be happy with what God has us because we are learning something. We're learning something new. So I, I often encourage young people when they are leaving off to college and they have no idea what they're going to do in life. That's encouraging. That's exciting because God is showing them where they're going to go. God is leading them step by step by step. And if we believe in the scripture that says that he's already ordered our steps, why do we got to worry? Why should I be worried about my future if, God, if I'm in God's hands? We just got to live every single day, but we have to have an ear to listen. We have to have the ear to listen. We have to know him and know his voice, to know that was God. 
I read a meme the other day. A meme. Yeah, I'm pretty cool. <laughs> I'm pretty cool. I read a meme the other day that says, sometimes we go through something and we just got to look up and say, I knew that was you. Sometimes when we go through some stuff, to just wake up the next day and have the ability not to give up, we got to look up and just say, I know that was you. I read another, story, another meme of a bird standing on a fence, and the rain was coming down, and his head is bowed. And the, the meme said, sometimes we just got to bow our heads and weather the storm. And sometimes, church, the biggest lie, or sometimes we have to weather the storms as Christians. The biggest lie anyone ever told me back in 1991 when I gave my life to Jesus was life was going to be great. The biggest lie anybody ever told me was, your problems are now gone. I was like, oh, for real? I was so excited. Like, are you serious? Like, nobody wants to kill me now? Really? I can get off drugs? Are you for real? Can I tell you, the biggest lie anyone ever said was, God, that life was going to be awesome. And it was cool. It was awesome for those three days we were up at Mountaintop. Because, come on, when you go to camp and it's just you and God, right, and there's no cell towers. Well, we didn't have cell phones back then anyway. But, but when there's no cell towers now, or back then, there were still no cell towers, huh, honey? I mean, when there's no cell towers, it is, it is awesome. But when I came back down that mountain and somebody wanted to fight me the first day of school because of stuff, I won't get into that, because of stuff, I mean, all my life wasn't grand. I was like, wait, 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 where's God? Where's Where's God in all this? Wait, wait, what's going on? I'm not supposed to fight. I'm a Christian. I'm not supposed to fight. <laughs> Christian. I had problems. And then people wanted money, and then people wanted this, and on and on. And I started like, feeling problems. I started to believe, like, hey, 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 that, that God thing was just emotion. That what I felt was just emotion. That's what, what, what's going on? That's what I felt. And it wasn't until my pastor actually sat down with me and says, it's not that you're not going to have problems. You know, it's not that we're not going to face and go through our weather, our storms. It's just now we have somebody to lean on. We're not doing it by ourselves anymore. We actually have somebody walking with us. And can I tell you something? When I'm with somebody in a new territory or in a new place that I have no idea, I'm okay as long as they're not scared. Does that make sense? I mean, if you're somewhere and you're lost and you have no idea how to get home, I'm cool as long as I'm with the dude that knows and looks, he knows where he's going. I'm like, you know where you're going? Cool, let's do this. I don't care. The moment I get scared is when they look scared and nervous and lost. I'm like, wait up, bro. You have no idea where I'm going? What, what? Then I'm like, what? What? I'll, at that moment, I'm like freaking out. But with God, and because he knows where I'm going, he knows where I'm going to end up, I have enough faith in God to know that he'll never leave me nor forsake me, that he's not setting me up for disappointment. He's actually setting me up for greatness. He set me up for that. And see, David remembered where he came from. David understood that. So when he took, he ascended to the throne, he was able to lead with integrity. He was able to lead with a skillful hand. Because he went through what he went through to be successful where God had him to go. And that's what God needs us, God has for each and every one of us. We should be excited when God is doing something new. Sisters, what's your sister's name that's leaving? Sister. Yeah, y'all know her. You guys gave her a standing ovation, which I felt horrible because I turned around. And I'm like, shoot, everyone's standing, and I don't want to be the last one to stand, so I just kept seated. seated. But in my heart, I was standing up. I, you guys caught me off guard. I was like, oh, shoot, we're standing up. Damn, I missed it. I judge people when they stand up last, so I didn't want to be, judge myself. Yeah, whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so I stayed seated. I was like, get it, girl. But we should be excited for her. Because she's going to do something God's called her to do. And what I love about that is that God has already picked the next person to come and fill her spots. Because God, because God is doing things beside us. What I love about the story about Moses and Joshua, when Moses died and Joshua took over, God cleared his throat and kept talking. He kept talking. He said, my servant Moses is dead, but you, Joshua. God keeps speaking. In fact, the person that comes in needs to be greater than what Sister Jen was. Do you understand that? That God has something greater for each and every one of us if we are faithful to be there. I'm going to have the worship team. That, where's uh, Brother, Steve? Brother Steve? Do you guys still call him Big Steve? No, they don't? Oh. oh, not here. My bad. That's how long I've known him. When he was like, Big Steve. Right? I love you. Man, 
man, my sermon went sideways on me. I just want to do what God wants me to do. And I feel like this morning, I, I'm agreeing with Pastor Dave, that there are people here that are heavy burden. You guys are going through some stuff, man. I can feel it. It's in the air. You know, um, a few years ago, I, my wife and I, we are, we are just coming out of a, of, a, of a horrible season in our life. Seven years. It was a seven-year season for us. And, and I'm talking like we lost everything. You know when people say they lose everything, but they really don't? No, bro. I lost everything. Almost lost our marriage, too. And we're, and we're now on this side, looking back, saying, wow, that, that's crazy. Now, there's a danger in that because we could always refer back to what God has done instead of looking forward to what God is doing. Does that, does that make sense? We get so stuck living in our past that we don't enjoy the moment that we're in right now. And God wants you to enjoy the moment right now. Even though it's hard, or, and maybe sometimes you can't even enjoy it, but appreciate where you are. Because you can believe in your hearts of hearts that it's not going to be like that in a year from now. In five years, you're going to look back and think, oh man, God, God was faithful. For us, it was seven years. We look back over the last seven years and, man, God was faithful. I'm looking at her thinking, how do we ever make it? it but God. That makes sense? But God. The most horrible thing that I could do, or we could do, is to constantly remind ourselves, of what we went through. Now when we talk about it, we're talking about like, like, oh man, oh you think that's jacked up? Listen to our story. And it's not like a, <laughs> oh yeah, I can't believe. It's more like of a testament of what God did. It's more of a memorial, if you will, an altar that's, that's there in our mile markers of life saying, oh yeah, man, 2013 was hell. It, it's, it's, a, it's a monument. It's, a, it's a, a tribute, if you will. It's a spot where, where our children can look back and say, man, that was hell. And if my parents can go through that, so I can go through this. And I believe nowadays, even yesterday, I was talking to my cousin, and I was saying, look, look, we went through some stuff. But now I'm able to talk about it. And the difference between me and him is that what he went through with his wife, he's still struggling with it. This was years ago. Ours was years ago, too. But not, but the difference is I could talk about it. We could talk about it because it's a testament of what God has done. And so, not, not that we can appreciate or, or, or be happy where we're at, but know that in a year from now, we will not be where we are today. That you will not be where you are right now. That the thinking that you have right now will not be the same thing that you have. You'll be thanking God of what he has done or where he has brought you from a year from today. Can I tell you, I'm reminded of the woman, of the Shodamite woman, where, where the, 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 the prophet said, this time next year you will have a child. And the following year, she had a baby. Even though she was happy being barren, she had a baby. The baby died. The baby died when she was five years old. And the woman said, how can God take the blessing that he gave me? He went back to the prophet and said, didn't I tell you it would have been better for me not to have a kid than for you to have a kid and for God to take it away? God was setting her up for a blessing because the prophet said, watch this. He went blew breath into him, the little boy sneezed and woke up. She was getting set up because if you skip a few chapters after that, Gehazi, the pro Elisha's assistant, was speaking to the king about that woman who had been, who was sent away because there was a famine. So for seven years, she was drifting and going from here to there and everywhere, basically in the desert trying to survive. And she went home after seven years and went to the king to ask for her stuff back. Just as she was walking in, Gehazi was telling about the story about when Elisha brought a little boy's life back and she comes into the throne room. At that moment, Gehazi looked at the king and said, my Lord, that's her. And the king said, is it true? Is that what God did? Is that what the prophet did in your life? And she said, yep, that's me. And the king said, what do you want? And she said, I want my stuff back. And what was awesome about the king was, she said, man, listen, there are some of you in this place that need to hear this right now. What the king said was, from the moment you left to the moment you return, you will be paid for the years you have lost. Meaning that you will not miss that gap of seven years. So what you are going through right now, what you are facing right now, when you get on the other side of this thing, God is going to give you from the moment that you went through it to the moment that you come back, that God is going to bless you more than you could ever expect. Because it's the word of God. So don't be sad at where you are right now. 
God has a plan. Man, that's, that, pro, that preached to me today. Because for years, church, I struggled with the fact that I should have been further where I am today. But God has me on this journey. I'm in the perfect place in the perfect time in my life. I'm in the perfect place in the perfect time for my life. And each and every one, each and every one of you, and even though it sucks, and I sorry to use the word, even though it's horrible, and even though you can't stand it, you are in the perfect place in the perfect time. I'm done with this, and then you can sing. There was a point in my life where I sat in the back of the church, and the preacher was preaching. And the words that would come out of his mouth, it took everything within me not to stand up and scream, it's a lie, because of what I was facing. I couldn't see beyond my problems. And I was so stubborn and angry that I, I couldn't I couldn't get beyond that. You know, my wife and I got back together. I went to counseling. I believe in counseling, by the way. The right counseling. Because I've been to some counselors. I'm like, bro, I hate your voice. Right, honey? Remember that guy? Oh, man. She told me that I would come home angrier than when I left. <laughs> Crazy. It does his voice. What do you feel? What do you mean what I feel? I'm angry. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so I believe in the right counselor. And I was went to see a counselor to kind of better myself. Because I had this anger issue. I had this like beast. And this preacher began, or he, I call him preacher, but this counselor began to say, well, let's let's talk about that. And, and he said, let's ask God. <laughs> and I laughed. I'm like, what do you mean, ask God? He says, let's ask God why you're so angry. And for 45 minutes, I couldn't ask God because I couldn't believe it was that simple. I couldn't believe that I could ask God a question and he's going to respond to me. For real? He's going to tell me why I'm so angry. Seriously, isn't he busy dodging comets from Earth and stuff like that? I mean, shouldn't he be like creating new galaxies and new universes and stuff? Why is he going to answer me? Right? Why would he answer a question like, hey God, why am I so angry? And for 45 minutes, I'm arguing with this counselor saying, are you, what? You want me to, what? I, I don't, I, and he, just, he says, just ask him. That's always, just ask him. And I'm sitting there like, but it just doesn't, I, I don't, I, I, for real? Just ask him. Finally, I said, fine. God, why am I so angry? Just like that. Why am I so angry, God? And I was like, do something. Right? I'm sitting there like this, waiting. I waited for 20 minutes like this. Looking at him. Am I doing it right? Should I fall down? Should I get on my knees? No, just stand there. I'm like, all right. Should I ask him again? Maybe he's busy. I, I do. I start playing these, these games. Like, maybe God. He says, no, God heard you. God's not deaf. I'm like, okay. 20 minutes. I'm sitting there like this. And all of a sudden, 20 minutes into it, thinking that God has an answer. Because you know why? I was nervous. I was scared that God wasn't going to respond. I was literally, literally shook in my being, thinking, what if God doesn't answer me? What if this God that I have served for so long doesn't answer me? What, is, what if this God that I have preached about doesn't respond to my request? He's just standing there. And I sat there 20 minutes into it. And I felt warmth come over my body. And I remember feeling it. And then the, pre, the, the, the counselor goes, there it is. I'm like, I don't know what that is, but like, I feel hot. He says, here it comes. And I can't, church, I didn't hear an audible voice. I didn't hear a voice in my head, but I got a picture in my mind. God reminded me of a memory when I was sixth grade, when I got beat up by a senior in high school. That he beat me so bad that the only reason why he stopped beating me was because he got tired and left. And that moment, and a beast called anger was birthed in my life. And it grew over years. And he told me that anger was my soothing mechanism and my defense mechanism. Because I swore that day that no one would ever make me feel like that ever again. Ever again. Well, here we are, fast forward, six years, seven years later, I get saved, right? And as Christians, we're not supposed to feel like that and think like that and act like that. So I lock up this thing, this beast called anger. Well, the problem with locking it up instead of killing it is that it can get loose. And it got loose in my life back in 2013. And I was an angry individual. And God brought that memory back to my life. Just like that. Because we, we serve a God, we worship a God, we believe in a God that will answer even the most minuscule of questions. The most minuscule of questions. If we are just put in position to listen. 
to listen. If we would just stop and listen. We, we live in such a society today where we have to be doing something and talking and responding and on and on and on. If we would just stop and listen to what God has for us, I believe that God could take us all the way through. Where you are today, what you're facing today, God already knows about it. He hasn't forsaken you. He hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't. He hasn't. You just need to believe that you are in the perfect place, even though it's the most horrible, horrible situation. It could be an uncomfortable situation. It could be a very stressful, anxiety, anxiety, anxious situation. But just know this, that God has you in the perfect place at the perfect time. Because God wants to use that for his glory.